Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about the case of the Queen and Carlos. This is an important case and that's because it's a Supreme Court decision, so highest law of the land. And it's the case that covers when something is in storage versus when it's in use. That's important because being in storage triggers all sorts of additional restrictions and requirements in order for it to be lawfully stored whereas there's far fewer restrictions on what you do with it in use. So the difference between stored versus in use can be the difference between a conviction and an acquittal, as we'll see in this case. So let's dive in here. This is actually at the Court of Appeal level. This case will go on to the Supreme Court, and in fact already has. But just so you're aware, as we go through this, this isn't the final decision, but this, this level of court lays out the facts that we'll need to understand in order to understand what happens at the Supreme Court later. So we see here uh, he's charged with storing a prohibited firearm that was loaded in a careless manner, uh, storing a loaded restricted firearm in a fashion that contravened the regulations, which in part here is because it's loaded, and the next count is storing a loaded prohibited firearm contravening the regulations, and again in part because it's loaded. Now, one thing we don't see here is anything relating to not having a license, and that's because Mr. Carlos was a licensed firearm owner at this time. Let's go through the facts here. So on the 15th of February, the RCMP searched the residence of the respondent at, and his address doesn't matter, they arrived at the premises at approximately 10.19 a.m. with a warrant to search. The search was made in connection with an application for a prohibition order pursuant to Section 111 of the Criminal Code, that seems like the wrong section here to get a search. That really should have been under 117, but I don't know. Maybe the law has changed. I didn't actually look at the law as it was at the time. So maybe that's how it used to work. The warrant had been issued on February 14th, 2000. Note the timing on this because it gets interesting. The seeking of the prohibition order, a matter that is still pending, arose as a matter uh, or as a result of threatening comments the respondent allegedly made to some government officials which is always a bad idea, especially if you're a gun owner, but even if you're not, don't threaten government officials. At approximately 8.40 a.m. on February 15th, the RCMP telephoned the respondent and arranged for an 11 a.m. meeting with him at a local donut shop, Tim Hortons, which at the time was still Canadian, so this is a very Canadian story. The meeting was to, uh, to concern the RCMP's investigation of the respondent's alleged threatening behavior, that maybe could have used some proofreading. Tim Hortons was chosen as the venue because the respondent was reluctant to meet at Whitehorse RCMP headquarters. Approximately two weeks earlier, the RCMP, the respondent had attended its set headquarters and had felt uncomfortable and stressed by the questioning he underwent there, which is what happens when you go undergo questioning at the RCMP headquarters. Now let's look at the timing here. So the warrant is issued February 14th, Valentine's Day. I'm sure that's a, a wonderful Valentine's Day present. 8.40 a.m. on February 15th, they make this meeting and then, you know, to meet them at 11, and then they raid at uh, 10.20 a.m. What I think happened here, reading between the lines, is that the RCMP had a plan that didn't seem to have come off. What they wanted to do was to have him at the police station so that they could keep him there, in my guess, this is, I can't say for certain, but this is a tactic I've seen before, is they get you at the station and then they search your house when you're not there. And if you saw my previous video about why your spouse needs a firearms license, this is one of the cases where you can see it possibly happening in action, except that because he said that he wanted to go to Tim Hortons, I suspect that that got them a little, I suspect that that changed the plan. But I think this is what had happened here, because why are they trying to set up a meeting with this guy when they already know they've got a warrant to search his house? Why don't they just go to his house with the warrant? So it's a weird set of circumstances, but I think that's what explains it. That's my best guess. The meeting at Tim Hortons never took place, interrupted as it was by the search. The search yielded three loaded handguns, all of which were seized by the RCMP. The handguns, a 357 Magnum Ruger revolver, 22 caliber revolver, and a 44 Super Blackhawk Ruger revolver are either prohibited or restricted weapons as defined in the code. 
and some of them are nice guns. In addition to the guns being seized, the respondent was charged with the three counts quoted above. And then they go through the law here, so we'll skip that. The gun involved in count one, a 357 Magnum, was found behind a stereo cabinet on the upper floor of the house. It was wrapped in a rag and held within a plastic bag. It was, as I mentioned above, loaded with no trigger lock. The guns involved in counts two and three were found in a locked safe on the lower floor of the house. These two handguns were also loaded and had no trigger locks. At trial, the respondent testified that before the RCMP called at 8.40 a.m. that morning, he had taken the three guns out of the safe to clean, inspect, and to admire them. At some point, apparently early on, he loaded all three guns. He testified that he did so in order to check the guns for corrosion. I got some concerns about this. This seems a little strange to me, but okay. We'll see what the court says about this. Later, he took the 357 Magnum upstairs to check the documentation. I say no more about the propriety of inspecting firearms using live ammunition and carrying a loaded firearm upstairs to check documentation other than that it is unnecessary, dangerous, and incredibly stupid. In any event, the respondent further testified that he had un intended to unload them and properly store them in the safe before leaving for his meeting with the RCMP. The respondent's wife and his son who was sleeping after having worked a night shift, were home that morning. The police arrival, he said, caught him unawares, and he did not have the time to unload the guns or do anything other than place the two guns located downstairs into the safe and then place the one, the 357 Magnum, on the upper floor of the house behind a stereo cabinet in his living room. Now, let's just stop here and say, does this pass our bullshit test? Because I'm kind of thinking no. I don't really like these facts because how does this make any sense? Let's say you're, you know, caught by the police and you're in a panic. How is it that you, in a panic, put these guns in three separate locations or two separate locations that are on different floors? I kind of think you'd put them all in probably the same place. I don't know. And, you know, this story about loading them to check their corrosion... I can check a gun for corrosion perfectly fine without throwing live ammunition in it. There's reasons why you might load a gun in your house, but usually that's something like a burglar going on or something along those lines. I'm not sure what's happening here, but this smells fishy to me. So we'll have a look at uh, a little bit further. The territorial court judge correctly stated what the Crown had to prove in order to obtain convictions on all three counts. One, they were firearms. Two, the firearms were classified as restricted or prohibited weapons. Three, the firearms were loaded. And four, the firearms were stored. And I've underlined that here because that's going to be a key and important element. That's what this whole case is going to be fought over, is whether these firearms were stored. And with respect to count one, there was the added element that careless storage had to be proved. In dismissing the charges, the trial judge summarized her findings as follows. I accept that he loaded his firearms as he was cleaning and inspecting them that morning and that he panicked when the RCMP arrived. I accept that the location of the firearm in the living room was a very ill-planned hiding spot. I accept that Mr. Carlos had no intention to store the two firearms in the safe loaded as they were found, but had planned to unload all the guns and replace them into the safe had, the RCMP, or had not the RCMP arrived unexpectedly. All three firearms were found within the Carlos residence in close proximity to the areas of the house where Mr. Carlos was using them. Mr. Carlos never left the house that morning. The police called around 8.40 a.m. and arrived around 10.10 a.m. The guns, therefore, had been loaded and left in that condition for no more than several hours. All of, these, all of those circumstances, which I accept to be the factual background in this case, do not, in my view, amount to the uh, storage of the firearms in question. So the trial judge buys his story. She accepts the story as, as given. And one important thing is that it's very hard to shake facts on appeal. Usually you can't. Usually the facts as found by the trial judge are just what you're stuck with. And the reason why that is is because the trial judge is the person who actually gets to see the cross-examination. They get to see people's faces they get to hear the tone of their voice they get to see the exhibits in person they get all of this whereas the appellate court what they get is a text record 
And so in most cases, unless it's something where it's glaringly obvious, uh, for instance, if somebody says, I never went into the house and the judge says, you know, this individual testified that when he entered the house, X, Y, and Z, and you can see he never testified to that. He testified to the opposite of that. Unless you've got something that sort of obviously wrong, the court doesn't mess with these with the facts. They just are stuck with the facts as found by the trial judge. So the Court of Appeal is stuck with those facts and the Supreme Court is going to be stuck with those facts. Even though I kind of think they're a little shaky here. But that's what the judge found. And the judge was, again, the person who could see all of this. Maybe they've got a better decision-making ability on that than I do. But I'll let you be your own judge as to those particular facts. Let me know in the comments below what you think. So this is a little bit from the cross-examination here. I'm going to skip it, although you can look the case up and have a look. I'll leave a link to it in the description. So in essence, the case turns on whether the respondent's panicked actions taken immediately before the police entered his home amounted to storage of these firearms. The meaning of the word stores, which is not defined in the criminal code, is therefore crucial to the disposition of this matter. What they're saying is the you know, if these are stored, he's in trouble. If they're not stored, he's going to walk. The territorial court judge applied the following dictionary definition to the word store, to reserve, put away, or set aside for future use. She further found that the definition of stores contains no temporal parameters. I will return to that latter finding below, but I accept that the plain meaning of stores, as applied by the trial judge, is the correct meaning to apply to the word in this context. In that light, I agree with the trial judge's reasons. The respondent would not have placed the firearms where they were discovered if the RCMP had not arrived unexpectedly. The law does not require that firearms be continuously stored. Guns may be handled within limits prescribed by law. I pause here to note that the res had the respondent been charged with careless handling of these fi three firearms, it is likely that the Crown would have been successful at trial. This is the Court of Appeal saying, Crown, you should have charged the right count. And really what the Crown should have done is charge both things so that that way the court should fi could find one or the other. Had they said either we want storage or we want handling, then Mr. Carlos wouldn't have had a good defense here because this we see that the court is saying that loading these firearms and doing the things he's doing with them was careless. So it would have been a much harder case for Mr. Carlos at the trial level had the Crown charged both careless handling and careless storage. Uh, however, he was not so charged. He was charged with careless storage and storage contrary to the Firearms Act regulations. The Crown has failed to establish that the guns were stored. As I stated above, the trial judge found that the concept of storage has no temporal parameters. I agree with that finding in the sense that a conviction can follow from short-term storage. I wish to note that the intention of the accused makes all the difference in short time cases such as the one at bar. Remember, we're going to come back to this because the Supreme Court's going to have an opinion, so don't take this as the final word. On this point, let me first say that it is axiomatic that the longer a gun is not used, shipped, handled, etc., the easier it should be for the Crown to prove that a gun is stored. If a gun has very recently been put aside, like in this case, the intention of the accused in doing so will decide the matter. If the trial judge finds that the accused only did so because the police were at his door and he, he or she did not have time to properly store them, there should be an acquittal. However, if an accused did not know the police were arriving and had just placed the guns as they were placed in this case because he was done handling them for a time, then clearly one or more of the offenses under Section 86 of the Code would be made out. I would also like to mention that a conviction for careless storage may have also have been entered in this case if the Crown proved that the gun located upstairs was left unattended for a sufficient period of time that one could say the respondent put it aside for future use. The respondent could not have been both upstairs and downstairs that morning, and the evidence indicates he spent more time downstairs. However, the evidence on this point was insufficient to support a conviction. For the fo foregoing reasons, I would dismiss the appeal. So Mr. Carlos walks at the Court of Appeal. But that's not all, because the Supreme Court is going to weigh in, and I will tell you the Supreme Court is going to throw all of this out. So I kind of like this. I like what the Court of Appeal did, 
And you may like what the Court of Appeal did. It's not the law. This is the background. Moving on to the Supreme Court. So we have the Supreme Court starting out with accepting as we must the findings of fact made by the trial judge. What do you think the Supreme Court is saying here? Hmm. Basically, they're saying we're stuck with this as a matter of law. We're stuck with accepting these findings of fact. But it's pretty clear from this little line because when the court, the court doesn't typically go on and on about things, but you can read a lot into a little line like this. And if you're a lawyer, this little line says a lot because they wouldn't have put it in otherwise. What they're saying is we think these findings of fact are probably bullshit. They're probably wrong. They're probably not accurate, but we're stuck with them. But do you think that might affect their decision making as to whether or not they think that Mr. Carlos should walk on this? You bet it probably does. And as much as we think that the court should not be sort of affected by this kind of thing, it does. Judges are people. They get affected by this kind of thing. So we start out with that little bit. And they note, uh, we disagree with the majority of the Yukon Territory Court of Appeal that the actus reus of storage within the meaning of Section 86.1 has not been made out. There is no requirement in that section that the accused plan a long-term or permanent storage. The trial judge found that the respondent deposited a loaded 357 Magnum in an ill-planned temporary hiding spot. In all the circumstances, in our view, this amounted to storage within the meaning of Section 86.1 of the Code. The same applies to the temporary placing of the two loaded handguns inside a locked safe. So even though he only meant for them to be there for however long the cops were at his door, that's still enough time. In the circumstances of this case, where the respondent, as he put it, rapidly set aside and hid his loaded firearms in a panicked state, intending to retrieve them shortly thereafter, the facts amply support the conclusion that he stored them within the meaning of that section. There are obviously circumstances where a short interruption in the use or handling of firearms would still constitute use or handling rather than storage. In this case, however, the respondent took steps to put away and hide his weapons such that the proper characterization of his actions was that he stored them, albeit temporarily, rather than continue his use and handling of the firearms in plain view of the police. We are of the view that the storage was careless in one case and in contravention of the regulations in the other two. We therefore agree with uh, Ryan J.A., who was the dissent, uh, dissenting in the Court of Appeal, that the acquittals must be set aside and convictions entered on all three counts. The matter is remitted to the trial judge for sentencing. So they're not even having another trial because the facts as found by the trial judge uh, say that a conviction should follow be once we apply the as the Supreme Court says, the correct law. And unfortunately, we don't get to argue with the Supreme Court on this. So as much as I like the Court of Appeals decision better than the Supreme Court, what we see here is that the Supreme Court has said, even if you're only intending to hide it for maybe even a couple of minutes, that is storage. However, note the bit about there are circumstances where a short interruption would not uh, indicate storage. So as an example here, let's say you've got your guns laid out on a table. You know, you've got all your cleaning equipment and you're in the process of cleaning them and you got to go to the bathroom. And so you get up, you don't put the gun away, you don't move it, you don't anything. You just leave it right where it is. You get up, you go to the bathroom and in that second while you're there, your pants are down, you're doing your thing, the cops burst in your door and find the gun laid out with all the cleaning equipment. I don't think they could make out storage in that case because you never intended to store it. You didn't take any of those steps. You were using it and then you had a short interruption. Similarly, you know, if you were practicing dry fire, so you've got a gun, it's empty, but you're playing around with it. And then you hear your wife screaming and, you know, she's in the kitchen. She's tipped something hot on herself and you you know, you rush to attend to that and you leave the gun on a counter somewhere. That would also probably not count constitute storage because you never intended to leave it there. But think about the alternative. If you, you know, let's say you've got kids in the house. And so when you hear that, you take the gun and you instead put it up on a tall shelf 
so that the kids can't get to it while you deal with this crisis. In that case, the court might say you've now taken an intervening step to store it. And so now you're going to be held liable because you didn't trigger lock it, put it in a safe, whatever else. That could be a harsh ruling if you, you know, if you were responding to some emergency like that. But this is a very strict test for storage. It basically says so long as you're not using it right at that moment or not in the course of some rapid interruption. We can see here also the court's language suggests that had the accused essentially stopped cleaning the guns and then immediately gone and responded to the police, opened the door for the police and had said, you know, oh, what's this about? And the police look behind him and they see the gun being cleaned. In that case, they couldn't have gotten a conviction for storage, although they might have been able to get a conviction for, you know, careless use, as noted, because these guns were loaded and the court took a dim view of that. But, you know, it essentially says if the cops are at your door, you either need to store the guns properly or not touch them at all. Just go and deal with the police which maybe isn't the result that most people would think of in circumstances like this. But it also quite clearly tells us that one of the things people say online uh, over and over and over again, I've seen this, where people say, so long as you're home, the guns are in storage. And that is not correct. That is not the law. That is a great way to get yourself into a lot of trouble. Because if you're in a situation where you're not using them, and your guns aren't stored properly, you know, you've got a loaded handgun tucked in a drawer and you're sitting there watching TV and you say, oh, it's in use because I'm home. Well, the Queen and Carlo says not so much. You're going to go to jail. You're going to lose your guns. You're going to get a criminal record. All of these things you don't want. So be aware of that. I know it's not a ruling that some of you will like, but it is the, the law. Sometimes I've had people send me angry comments saying, you know, why are you telling us these bad things? And because I don't want to be the guy who tells you the stuff that you like and that's wrong. I need to tell you the stuff that is correct, even if it sucks. And especially when it's this kind of thing where it can easily be a trap. Because I don't want anyone getting charged for sort of getting tripped up by a stupid trap. Anyway, I hope this has been educational. I hope it's been informative. If you have, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, there's the hit the bell for notifications if you want to get advanced notice or immediate notice once these videos go up. I really do appreciate your viewership. As I said, I've been blown away. Uh, I've got a link to my Patreon below. I'd like to thank my $10 Patreon supporters, my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, Mark D, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackelsdack, Jean Alexandre Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter Heinem, Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Server, Toyser for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Malcolm Taylor, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, and Scott Sweetman and Mike Rhodes, as well as a special thank you to uh, $30 supporter, Steve Browning. Once again, thank you for watching. I This isn't my favorite case, but I hope it's at least provided you with the knowledge that you need in order to govern sort of your own actions. And I hope it's armed you with knowledge. Thank you.